This week on The Double P, we are covering Lovecraft Country, Episode 2, Whitey's on the Moon. If you haven't seen that episode yet, we don't want to spoil you, so you might want to hold off listening to this podcast until you do watch the episode, but please come back after you have. And if you have watched the Episode 2 of Lovecraft Country, we hope you enjoy the podcast. It's Double M. Right up front, I'm kind of an apologist for this show so i it's hard for me to rate anything lower than a seven it's catfish oh my god oh my god it's a seven my god i want i want you i want to retrospectively to go back and for you to be my teacher all through school two wonderful panelists i'm sorry you answered one out of 20 questions on the quiz you get a b minus <laughs> Double, 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 double P podcast. Double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P podcast. We are a proud part of the Double P family of podcasts and the home of your 73rd favorite podcast episode covering Lovecraft Country last week and your 59th favorite podcast overall covering the series. Yeah, well, take that, number 60, in your face. We in the top 60. Welcome to Shoggoth Surprise. Also known as Shoggoth Surprise. That's so much better. All right, <laughs> this is episode two of the podcast. We are on the Double P podcast main feed, and we are reviewing Lovecraft Country episode two entitled Whitey's on the Moon. That is based on a poem which we actually heard, or a spoken word performance that we actually heard in this episode by whom did you say, Catfish? Gil Scott Heron. Right on. I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, it, it's going with the, the the whole imagery of what was happening to Atticus at the time. I thought that was crazy. Uh, the teleplay was by Misha Green, and it was directed by Daniel Sackheim. Is that how you say his name? Sure, I think so. Why not? Why not? Yeah, it is now. That's how you say his name now. Uh, you might know him from some uh, True Detective episodes in season three uh, or episodes of The Americans or episodes of House. He's done a lot of stuff. So, by the way, my name is Double M. Double M. That's Matt Murdick. And I am joined by a man who is constantly trying to get away from me by digging through the ground. It's Catfish. Yeah, uh... I'm trying, but then I hear that whistle and I can't get away. <laughs> uh, double M? Yes, wow. sir. Here we go. We're on episode two. Before we get into it, let's make a quick uh, begging. We are going to beg, please give us reviews on iTunes. Follow us on Spotify. Give us reviews on Stitcher. Please give us a written review. One star, five star, it doesn't matter. That way more people get to hear are wonderful words. You can also hit us up at double PHQ on Twitter. You can hit me up at CJGman67 on Twitter. Matt, how can they get you on Twitter? At Musical Concepts. And don't forget, you can also find the Double P on Facebook. That's facebook.com backslash double PHQ. Or on YouTube, that's uh, search for Double P Media on YouTube, and you'll find us that way. Because we want to take comments from everywhere. The Facebook page the YouTube. We definitely need your reviews. And anybody who leaves us a review between now and the conclusion of this series is entered in what kind of contest, Catfish? Oh, uh, well, we got those cute little figures. We're going to give you a cute little uh, Shoggoth. Uh, uh, what's his butt? You know what it's called. Funko Pops. Funko that's right. Pops, that's ladies what I, and gentlemen. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I, I, I'm embarrassed because I literally have just bought Four of them. I got two of the child, one with the cup, and one with the frog in his mouth. I got one of Daenerys uh, with a dragon, and then I got one of Mr. Rogers. That's right. There's a Funko Pop of Mr. Rogers. Wow. Well, you have four more than me. I don't do those things. So. I went on a I went on a Funko Pop frenzy, and I couldn't even remember what the hell they were called. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Matt. So here we are. Episode two, Whitey's on the Moon. Before we get into it, let's share our ratings. What are your ratings for, for, for this episode? I didn't think, really, and I, I know I only gave last week's episode an eight. I was trying to give myself some headroom, and I'm glad that I did, because this episode just totally blew me away, Catfish. I love this episode so much more even than last week's, and I loved last week's, even though there were a great m number of things 
to hate about what was happening to our characters in last week's episode. There was a lot to deal with in this particular episode as well. However, I, just so many quick changes and surprises and and fake outs and and oh, I yeah. was just jerked around like crazy. I, I had to give this nine point five, what I call double D's. Double D's. Dastardly doorways, all those little doorways that mm. Christina could look through. I gave it nine point five out of ten. I mm. it was just incredible and i'm not even going to get on some of the music i normally you know one of my big pet peeves is how the music is uh, from a time period way or later than than what have you that's only when it's being played on a radio or something like that though it doesn't bother me when it's just part of the episode to create the the texture or the the context and so uh, the only problem that i have now was i can't remember if last week's version of the Etta James tune was played on the radio or not, but that would have been 1961. I don't actually think it was. I think it was just part of the setting, so I'm okay with that. Well, Matt, it's almost as if they said to themselves, when we do this series, the one thing that we have to make sure of is that we don't upset uh, Matt Murdock. Yeah, that's exactly right, because I'm so be the just, person to say. So they just thought, we're going to put in audio cues that are appropriate irrespective of time wildly irrespective of time uh we got <laughs> tierra whack last week uh we'll talk about the craziness that happens this week uh besides uh that amazing spoken word poem uh by Gil scott heron um we'll talk about that in a second so matt uh, you know what's funny i gave last week a nine i'm gonna stick with it i'm sticking with nine obviously double piece D- double piece you mean parsec passion no no, it's not packed podcast either, but people are going to recognize what this is. This is when you know you're having some guests come over, right? Yes. And so you decide to have emergency sur- surgery to have your liver taken out so it can be delivered and your guests can eat it. So, of course, double P stands for personal pates. I love it. I love it. You know, they are doing an amazing job through two episodes. It didn't let down in this episode. Uh, I have faith it's going to continue where there are two equal dangers to these characters and they're represented Mm. as both as as equally threatening to their lives. And that is the supernatural dangers as well as the dangers uh, because that they that they are experiencing in this time period uh, because they are people of color. So yeah. they managed once again, I thought maybe once we get into the house, it's going to go more one way. It didn't a- again, uh, you know, just like last week when I was just as on the edge of my seat during the shock of the attack as I was when they were trying to get away from the sheriff and they had that time crunch here. It's the same kind uh, came kind of thing that we'll talk about when we get to them. So, I mean, through two episodes, this series not only feels very shorthanded, but it is clear that this series is, uh, we talked about it a little last week, it is clear that this series is going to be the anti-Penny Dreadful City of Angels. That is, they are not going to spend <laughs> five episodes building up to something. Every episode is going to burn through a lot of plot. I mean, Matt, didn't you think we would be at <laughs> in the woods here for if not the rest of the season, at least a good six or seven episodes? Well, I even commented commented last week, Catfish. I I asked you the question. I said, are you worried that it's going to slow down now that they're here? I haven't read the book, so I have no idea how fast things are going to come or how fast things are going to go. And I was just shocked. And it's like, wait a minute, this part's over. What's (laughs) next? (laughs) Right, exactly. Holy cow, we're already on episode eight of a normal show. (laughs) <laughs> fabulous we're on fabulous. season two of penny dreadful city of angels <laughs> maybe even season five i don't know could be P- penny dreadful city of angels pour one out for them this week as they were officially uh certified as dead um, <laughs> you know so- what one reason why this show is so much better perhaps uh, even or is <laughs> there is, are so many reasons well <laughs> Do you know one reason why uh, this show is having more success than the other show had? Because they've got twice as many viewers as the other show really ever had. I think uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels 
had shy just shy of half a million viewers on its initial air which was uh, back in april when everybody was at home and could be watching now people are running around willy-nilly without masks but still three quarters of a million people watched the premiere last week and the demographic was like five times as much for the 18 to 49 year olds as it was for the showtime show now i wonder matt i mean i what i am hoping for what i'm uh, what am i expecting i mean this is a little bit different because it's a is a supernatural show so uh, maybe this won't happen but what i'm hoping is kind of what happened for the watchmen which was it felt to me not looking at the numbers that it was growing and growing and becoming more of a national conversation every week yeah uh because i because even though these numbers are way better than penny dreadful you know um maybe it's just my snobbiness but i suspect that hbo expects better numbers for their shows well when you have a show like game of thrones or something like that which pulls like seven million viewers a week uh then you know this is just a tenth of that but i like to think of it more like there's lots of headroom to keep climbing yeah that's my hope too that again that it'll become uh, more in the conversation I felt like Watchmen was good, but by the end, everyone was talking about Watchmen. One of the best seasons of television I have ever seen in my life. No Shoggoth Sherlock? No Shoggoth Sherlock. All One right. of the best seasons of television ever. All right. Well, that seems right up Lindelof's alley. And, uh, of course, we have J.J. Abrams tied to this. And Jordan Peele, of course. And Misha Green, this is her second teleplay uh, in a row, uh, wonderful job. Absolutely mm-hmm. fantastically mm-hmm. crafted show. Uh, we, as we said before, we need your reviews so that we don't just stay the 59th favorite podcast covering Lovecraft Country. And we did get a lot of reviews, Catfish. Oh, in, great. In the last few weeks. I love it. However. Uh-huh. Don't say that. No praise for us as a podcast. Instead, as you know, This Double P stopping point has multiple podcasts on it, Mm -hmm. and all of our feedback, all of our reviews, rather, on iTunes, U.S. iTunes, came for Bubba and Tiny's dark podcast, Wind in Caves. But we needed to to clean up some of this stuff so that we can uh, make room for you to leave a written review. Oh, all right, all right. Well, let's read a let's read a couple short ones. I don't want to read anything long about some other podcast we weren't even involved in. All right. Well, we'll start with uh, Haley Shea, who on August fourth said, "Great podcast. I enjoyed listening to Bubba and Tiny's commentary on Dark. They make a quote Dark." Show easier to understand. Okay, I think that was Harley Shay, but oh. okay, that's good. Harley Shay. Yeah. Hara21 asterisk says five stars. Great podcast if you love dark. I don't know why you'd be listening to it if you don't love dark. <laughs> I love listening to Bubba and Tiny discuss dark. Never has a series needed a podcast more than this one. Bubba and Tiny do a great job explaining, theorizing, and illuminating each episode, and they seem to be having so much fun doing so. Many thanks. Double G. These are some great reviews. I hope we can get some like that, too. All right. One more, Matt. Go ahead. Read one more. All right. Well, we want to thank Joe POC for leaving a five star review. And we also want to thank Doug Egelhoff uh, for leaving a five star review as well. Great dark podcast. And they're getting really creative with these titles. New subscriber Bubba and Tiny do a great job. Well, great job, Bubba and Tiny. Good job, guys. Well, Matt, so did no one say anything about our last podcast? We got no feedback? Oh, no, that's not the case. Actually, we love it that you all came back to us with your tweets and everything regarding last week's episode of Mm -hmm. Lovecraft Country, the premiere. We got lots of tweets for those. Like Court, who is at Gendeve on Twitter, says, Fantastic. The acting was amazing and just the right amount of horror. The monsters were scary, too. Yeah, Susan at Barbasu. These are these are two, by the way, old school listeners, no. loyal listeners. Susan says both the supernatural and human monsters were scary, and she gave us our hashtag nice. Shagath Surprise. That's the hashtag we want in. Great. Shadowcat underscore Beck says by far the best series premiere I've seen in years. I'm in. 
Shadow Cat, I'm close. I'm close with you on that. Uh, yes. Our our loyal listener Pat Spinagle at Patman23 said H.P. Lovecraft says a person sucks, but he's very quotable. Amen. Yes, we talked a lot about that on our last podcast, uh, and he you put this quote: "We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far." He Ooh. says, "I was struck by this quote in relation to the protagonist of the story." who publish guidebooks to assist in people's voyages. He says the guidebooks are like the opposite of the Necronomicon. <laughs> okay, what's a Necronomicon? The Necronomicon, as we all know from Ash vs. Evil Dead, is the Book of the Dead. And it is oh. and it is name drop here tonight. Uh, and only to say what they're, the, the book they're talking about is not the Book of the Dead, but the book of names, the book of the living. So we'll get into that when we get there. Okay. Well, the other thing that Patman23 said to us was regarding our podcast. What a great yes! What a great episode of hashtag Shoggoth Surprise. I really enjoyed the first episode of the show where Atticus wistfully defends John Carter, talking about how people like him don't get to go on adventures and fight monsters. And yet Atticus now gets to go on adventures and fight monsters, etc. We need some debate topics happening on the podcast, though. Uh, oh, okay, we'll get on that, Pat Man. What do we have? What do you say? Uh, since humans can turn into Shoggoths, is it ethical to kill a Shoggoth? Since maybe there's a spell to turn a Shoggoth back into a human. It's a classic Ash versus Evil, evil Dead argument. It, 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 is, it is a classic argument. I will. I will. I'll kind of say this about that: if they're humans that should be killed anyway, then yes, it's absolutely ethical to kill them. I, I will. I will say this about this: I'm a video game player, and there's a series called Mafia, and I played the first one. It was a very stereotypical, like set in the '40s kind of stuff like that. And I didn't play the second one. And the third came out, and it was set in New Orleans, and it had a black protagonist. Mm. And there were a lot of racists in the game, Matt, and I really enjoyed uh, killing all those racists. <laughs> so I'm going to say, yes, if someone merits death, you know, it's not like Letty turned into a Shoggoth. It was the, it was the damn uh, policeman. Yeah, it was Enos or whatever his name was. I don't even remember, but he was not worth saving to me. By the way, I don't think we ever satisfactorily decided on Ash versus Evil Dead. They were playing fast and loose with the rules of whether you could turn undead and come back. Well, fast and loose with the rules. That's the way we play here on this podcast also. Mm -hmm. At Hunt Pants, that's our friend Holly on Twitter. She was telling uh, telling us about the episode as well. By the way, she co-hosts a podcast with me called The Dust, which covers his dark materials. There's a new season of that coming out this year, so look for our uh, podcast to return then. I'm sorry for you. Yeah, okay. You, <laughs> well, you've made your feelings quite clear. <laughs> and, uh, but about this show, uh, at Hunt Band says, I was really feeling it. Then suddenly I was screaming and jumping out of my seat with fright. I can't wait for more. <laughs> That's a pretty good feeling on this. Uh, she also added that the tension with the cops then going straight into horror was a fun surprise. I don't know if any of these surprises are fun for me, Catfish, but uh, they definitely I, are surprises. You know Holly is a very special person and her definition of fun uh, may be different than mine. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we heard also heard from our longtime loyal listener as well. At Dooley's Left Legs, what did he have to say, Catfish? He said, worth the wait. Blown away. Can't wait for next week. The Shoggoths were definitely a surprise. <laughs> it is hashtag Lovecraft Country, action-packed, surreal at times, catch me right away. Love, Uncle George. Edit James and Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, at Dooley's Left Legs. And uh, a return from a loyal listener who we haven't heard from in a while, well, yeah, that's Matt Foster at Fat Monster on Twitter. And he says, I'm back, fellas. And that's a shock of surprise. After getting married and having two kids, I finally got my priorities straight and I'm back to follow along this wild ride. Great to hear your voices again. Don't screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> you mean how Matt screwed his life up? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, not only that, Matt, but I have to explain to you that one of the definitions of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So if you're listening to us all the time and expecting us to not screw things up, then I'm sorry, you're insane. <laughs> it is uh, definitely glad to have you back. Glad to have you back, Matt. Thanks for listening. Uh, we also got some Facebook responses, like our friend Axel Foley from uh, DVR Podcast Network. You can check them out at DVRPodcast.com. Uh, he said, so glad you guys are covering this. Seth Bell also said, excited to see if this show will be good. Disappointed that I've heard it's an anthology, which I wasn't aware of, Catfish, but you uh, have you heard anything to this regard? Uh, I had not heard anything about that either i tried to look it up just briefly at the time and couldn't find anything uh but what i told seth was that first of all we talk about it on the podcast and we're talking about it right now i'm glad that it is uh because they are going to tell this full story and the thing about doing it this way is that really uh, i feel like we've had some amazing first seasons of things uh the terror I remember all the way back to the first American Horror Story. Had no idea. No, I think no one knew that it was a uh, that that was an anthology. And so when they wrapped that up, that was exciting. Uh, it does. Uh, and again, the afore the aforementioned uh, Watchmen, which they just are told a total complete story, and they're probably kicking around ideas to bring it back. But nonetheless, a complete story was told there. Um, what this does lead to, in some cases is a uh, disappointing second seasons. Mm. Uh, yeah. I've tried to watch a lot of the succeeding uh, uh, series of American Horror Story. And uh, the only one I was able to get through is 1984. And it was still still a mess at the end. Uh, we loved the first season of The Terror. The second season we talked a little bit about last week was a was a show like this and Penny Dreadful City of Angels is trying to address struggles like that. Is, that's putting it lightly yeah. uh, that people of color have had to go through telling that story concurrently with uh, a a horror or, or suspense story. And so we'll see how that goes. It, it, now, it's not just a it's not just an anthology series that have a problem with that. Uh, once again, Penny Dreadful City of Angels one se season and one season only. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Seth says, though, he'd fallen off list of the podcast since Ash ended. Oh, so sad about Ash versus Evil Dead ending. Looking forward to some double G. Double G? Yeah, great goofs. Oh. Of course. Oh, well, that's that's definitely me. I'm a goof. Uh, let's see. One other one. Uh, David Gobert. Have heard Grumpy Gobert. Grumpy Gobert says... Does Evil Willow from Buffy count? I don't even know where that comes from. All right, so that must have been that must have been Bubba who responded to that because I thought you would know what the hell this was. Bubba says she counts. I'm old, so Princess Leia in ROTJ for me. Speaking of Bubba, you know he left us a yeah. comment on YouTube. Uh, what did he say? Saying question of the week: the red woman in the opening was most likely supposed to be Deja Thoris. I'm hoping saying that right. Uh, from Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter of Mars book series. Oh, and then asks us, Catfish, who's your sci-fi crush? Okay, so now I understand what David Gobert was answering. <laughs> that's his crush. That's, that's his oh, sci-fi crush. That's his sci-fi crush. All right, that sounds good. Now, uh, for me, uh, I'm kind of in line with Bubba here. If he's the one who answered, I'm old, so Princess Leia in Return of the Jedi, that that's that's a pretty good one for me. I kind of like that one. Ooh, man. You know what? This is this is hard. I'm trying to think. You know, I haven't thought about this yet. I'm sure I'll come up with a better answer right now, though. And I know this is going to sound weird. <laughs> I mean, first of all, <laughs> I mean, first of all, it would be uh, the original Wonder Woman. I know that's not a movie, but uh, oh the original man, Wonder Woman. yeah, Linda yeah. Carter. All right, yeah, it'd be Linda Carter. Um, you know what though? Even more than that, now that I think about it, I was okay with Linda Carter. This counts as sci-fi, doesn't? The, doesn't the Bionic Woman count as 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 sci-fi? I'm man. If you're gonna go with Jamie, yeah, I'm gonna. I'm I'm, I'm go with you there. 
Lindsay Wagner Lindsay all the way. That Wagner. dates the hell out of me. But Lindsay Wagner, oh my god, she could Woo. she could make those crappy ass sound effects sound so good just by watching her. I may need a moment. <laughs> all right, so Matt. You did. <laughs> yeah, let's go on before I need a moment. Uh, I was, you uh, asked a poll this week. Well, while well, you take your moment, I did ask a poll, and we'll put another poll out uh, for this week at some point. Uh, so be sure to check my personal Twitter at Musical Concepts. That's where I do it. Uh, probably at Double PHQ will retweet it. They likely do. Uh, but my question was, and it was in yes. regard to something that we talked about just a few minutes ago the music. And did. Uh, Tierra Wax tune clones take you out of the moment or the time period when you were watching the premiere episode. And it didn't really bother me. I thought it was culturally appropriate. So I was gr- glad to hear that out of 1,500 votes that we got on the 100K Twitter, 60% said no, it was great to hear, while only 40% said yes, it was weird to hear. That gives me hope. I feel like this is a, I feel like I have got two answers for this because. I think the t- truthful answer for me: What does it take you out? Oh yeah, it takes me out. Oh, it 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 it, it takes it takes me out for sure. I and then and the the spoken word uh, th- that was by Gil Scott Heron, which was after. I mean, the the James Baldwin last week uh, that was also uh, also later, but I think the James Baldwin's that that was like early sixties. I would say for sure it takes me out of because it's sort of it's sort of commenting. Now, w- when it takes me out, does it help reinforce some of the some of the motifs that they're trying to push here? Yes. Yeah. Yes, but 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 I, but I, I I can't think that it doesn't make you you're watching something in the 40s and then you hear something that's out of whack like that or you hear the Jeffersons ah, uh ah, tune ah, ah. that it doesn't that that it doesn't pull you out a little bit, but what it does is help kind of reinforce the themes of the show, and I think it in in it, it does it in 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 interesting ways. Well, we are moving on up to the recap, if you want. All right, let's move on up to the recap. Well, then. we do start off with the Jeffersons, and at the new palatial mansion, George and Letta they are enjoying the spoils of this new place. Letta's doing hey, all the clothes. Yeah. George has got this whole new shelves of books. Everybody loves everything except Atticus. Atticus kind of finds it strange that he's remembering what happened in the past. And he's just finding it strange that he's there. He's remembering what happened. And when William tells him that he will escort them to lunch, that's the butler kind of guy uh, who is both a friend and a boy, according to Christina. Uh, They're told by William uh, that they are to be treated like family, even though William doesn't seem to know where Attica's father is. So we get a history of the place with paintings and creepy white dudes are in these paintings. And then William tells them that the house is a rebuilt mansion that the original burned down in 1933. Atticus, 1833. 1833. Thank you. And Atticus asks if they go if they can go to that village that seems to be outside, that kind of triggers a little bit of tension. And in addition, uh, it seems like that the car that they were talking about uh, that happened to, you know, uh, do a tackle on the truck in the last episode, <clears throat> that one's there too. Um, but Atticus uh, tries to talk about what happened before, but George and Letta, they don't seem to remember it at lunch. They really don't remember. And the other thing that is weird, and I can't remember exactly where he points this out, but I thought the same thing, too, was there's books that George loves to read. There's a whole bunch of clothes that fit Letty. Mm -hmm. Now, even if they don't remember, this should be kind of a warning to them. I mean, let's remember, Letty didn't join them until the last minute. True. So maybe they could have thought, and, and investigated things about George, but at what point were they able to eyeball Letty's perfect measurements? It it, it should send off uh, warning bells, uh, even if those warning bells are actually uh, dinner bells. <laughs> uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's really weird about all of this, um, including uh, the the tension 
about the village just by itself. You can see that there's there's something there that uh, nobody wants them to be around. As George r remarks that they're being watched, um, Atticus is making a fuss about what happened. They don't remember. And then uh, they go to look at the car, Woody, because he's trying to prove to them that something did happen. And there it sits in perfect condition. And that's even more strange. Well, except for the break of the window and the blood that was supposedly all through the front. Yeah. The, the back window, which uh, was shot out. Yeah. Uh, I like how they fixed a bunch of stuff, but not everything. Not everything. Uh, but William tells him that that's how he found the car. Uh, but then all of a sudden, uh, they're they're like wandering through this, I don't know, it looks like a Puritan type, all white village. Um, yeah, they're dancing around the Maypole and shit. Yeah. And, and Letta, Letty and George, they wonder why they can't remember anything at that time. Then they hear the whistle, that same whistle that we heard that called off the Shagaths last week, except now there's these vicious dogs that are being held by a woman who... Who, who seems to have this whistle and uh, she makes no bones about it. She doesn't like the trio very much. Yeah. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here, Matt. Um, first of all, the dogs, the German shepherds. I mean, if you see, if you look at any black and white pictures of protests or anything like that, where uh, the, the police are harassing, attacking black people yeah you will notice that the dogs in those pictures are german shepherds ah. so there is a particular sort of indicator there uh the german shepherds were used to sort of terrorize peaceful protesters so so that that's that means something uh and if it that didn't mean enough their her whole thing about like talking about how black bears were, but forgetting to use the word bears, <laughs> that was also uh, quite disturbing. It was very and, disturbing. And pointed, yeah. And very pointed. And she talks about how the prying uh, and uh, how her dogs are beasts. And, and it just makes me think that, okay, well, no wonder that whistle would work on the Chagas. Um, hustling back to the lodge, George stops and he seems to think that the secret birthright was about Atticus's family tree being ancestors being slaves here at the uh, at Artem, the, the, the palace or the palatial mansion, the one that was burned down back in 1833. Yeah, this was my no Shoggoth Sherlock moment to find out that uh, Atticus is is uh, is related to uh, this situation by blood. By blood, uh, because evidently the master of the home decided to do with his slaves the same as Thomas Jefferson did. Suddenly, they're getting attacked. That was uh, that was the, that was more of our our burrowing uh, friendly Shagas. That was the Shagas. Uh, okay. Apparently, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, it was very, very dark. They're like, we don't want to finish the CGI too much. Let's make it very dark. <laughs> <laughs> now, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but when they come out of that tower. That's when George says, well, there's a basement and that's a good place to keep somebody. And 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 Tick is like, that's where my dad is. Yeah, that's where they decide that that's probably where they're keeping him. Once again, this show is going to be like, we're not messing around. We're already 15 minutes in the second episode. And they uh, they think they know where Atticus is. I'm going to say dad question mark. Yeah, is yeah. before we talk about that later before we talk about that later not only that but they don't waste any time with the shagath attack i mean immediately they're they're called off uh and christina appears and uh saves them and and tells them that they're coming back to the house there for dinner and what have you yeah but then immediately letty and george are like what happened how come we're dirty and then it's like oh it happened again they they lost their memory right away of the attack and and it sort of explained that they can handle this in a way um i kind of thought it was and i'm wrong because it turned out not many of these people who are around are actually related by blood to the braithwaites but that if you were a braithwaite you could see them but otherwise you forgot but that's not kind of what's happening here okay when they get back to the place christina takes atticus to a lab 
uh, where we have this hooded figure playing Operation uh, <laughs> uh, with a, a quite alive and quite awake man uh, who turns out to be what he, he calls himself Adam. Atticus is, of course, horrified. Uh, meanwhile, in his library, George is looking through some books and he, he removes one and a secret door opens. It leads to a huge library, a hall, a meeting hall. And there's a book called Order of the Ancient Dawn that catches his attention and he starts thumbing mm-hmm. through it. This is important for when they get to the dinner, I suppose. Oh, absolutely. He finds out a lot of, of again... People are not in this show. They're not withholding information from people. <laughs> people are getting info and they're acting on it almost immediately. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, uh, a man is being operated on. He he's, uh, just manages to just get up and he starts quoting scripture uh, and asking questions to Christina, who's answering kind of like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's totally disinterested in giving the answer, but she knows it verbatim, I guess, because she's been brought up that way. Now, the man, uh, is he Christina's father? He is Christina's father. And I don't know if his name is actually Adam, but when he tells the story, that's when Atticus goes, oh, okay, so I assume you're God in this story. And uh, that's when the man says, no, no, no way, I'm Adam. I'm I'm just Adam. <laughs> I'm just <Yeah. laughs> uh, I'm just Adam. Uh, but he dismisses Atticus and, and Christina. Uh, leads him away, and Atticus and everyone suddenly realize that they're kind of trapped in their own rooms. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff uh, that's going to happen to them as Christina is called to the stable to deliver a baby. What? Uh, Matt, I could just assume it's a baby Shoggoth. I mean, she's like, oh, yeah, when it's breached, that means it's a Shoggoth. Oh. It, it looked like a baby Shoggoth to me. It's, and she's like, it was her first time, but apparently she's a natural, Matt. Yeah, not only that, but she seemed quite uh, she seemed quite beholden by it as well. It was a cute moment, don't you agree? I do, and maybe it's just that over the course of this episode, our, our opinion of, of Christina changes a lot i mean when we first see her we assume she's just along for the ride with everything else but as we go through we see kind of her just dissatisfaction and that you know she is uh uh willing to maybe not stick with the program as it's been laid out right exactly in the meantime uh letty starts to remember what happened and she gets really horrified by it but as Atticus has realized that he's trapped, suddenly he's in her room. Now, that's mm-hmm. not right. I, it just seems like uh, they can't uh, do anything except try and calm these people with visions and that kind of thing. Um, she does. Yeah, I thought this was fascinating. And maybe, Matt, I was like, oh, they kind of made a mistake here where they jumped and we couldn't figure it out. But no. They were smarter than us. Yes, they were totally smarter than us because uh, after she reveals a little bit about her past, which uh, and about being abandoned, uh, and then uh, Faux Atticus, Faux Tick, says that, you know, uh, I'm never going to abandon you. So uh, th- th- the natural thing is to get it on. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, up to that point, it all seems quite natural and they're in a tense situation and we just assume these two kids are going to fall for each other eventually so Mm. it all seems all fine and normal and then you get the uh, shot the shot where you come out the window and it swings around the house and you go back in and you see that Atticus is in his own room and he's got his own little doppelganger thing going on there's a woman uh, it looks like she's Korean Uh, she's in a soldier outfit I suspect that she's the woman who was talking to him on the phone Uh, there's my no shoggoth moment for the uh for the episode. Right. And her name is Gia. And I believe, I don't know if that, I th- think that's what he called her I- in the dream as well. Or when he had the, the phone call, he, he said that name, but he definitely said it again tonight. All right. So this is whatever is in his past. He refers to it later as something horrible that he did when he was at war. But I assume she's still alive. So whatever he did involved her. She's still alive because he doesn't say, like, how the heck are you here? You're dead, Mm. which we hear shortly after this. (laughs) (laughs) 
George on his own, he's seeing someone uh, who I this is Atticus's mother, I guess. This is what we inferred uh, after the point. I did not know who it was at, at the time, but uh, feel free that we could assume that this is Ruby and she was Atticus's mom. Yeah, and she, she her picture was actually the one that uh, George had in his wallet when he was talking to his daughter, right? When he was in the last mm. episode, uh, her mm -hmm. picture was in it. And so here she is, and he says it's impossible. You know, this can't be real. And this one is – this is – this is a fascinating one because, you know, uh, what's really cool about this is even though he's like, you're dead, he's like, I'm not going to fully be I don't fully believe that this is happening. This is not really happening, but like, I'm going to go with it because I miss her. So that was kind of a kind of a sweet, weird moment. It was definitely sweet and weird. And this is what we expect from our our, our kind of love stories. Right. Especially in mm -hmm. horror is that they just get a little weird. Uh, so you know what you don't expect, though? Uh, Matt. <laughs> uh, perhaps the at the moment in in uh, Letty's bedroom uh, where uh, yeah, uh, yeah. a gentleman, you don't ex yeah, yeah, guy whips out his snake. His yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't, you know, some people walk, you know, the younger guys brag and they're like, yeah, I got a snake in my trousers. But this is the first one I've actually seen. This is the first time. <laughs> Um, so they're all starting to realize that it's not real. And uh, Christina actually is kind of watching them through some kind of magical window at the big party. Oh, yeah, they're party. all, they're all, they're all freaking looking at it. They're all. And we're here for your entertainment, evidently. That's awful. Um, but uh, then, of course, everybody gets called to dinner, except for Letty, because it's black tie and only men are allowed. Um, but he's going to provide dinner for her on the veranda, evidently. George makes a big speech about uh, being proud and, and not scared. And he he tells Atticus that he's come across something that might get him out of there. Which, at the dinner, everyone is staring at Atticus entering. But William, the butler kind of guy, reassures Atticus that he is supposed to be there. And Adam gives a speech well, uh, we, he he does. He also mentions sacrifice, and and that's when his liver gets delivered to everybody. And Tick is like, a, mm, "No, uh, maybe wait for the entree." <laughs> George uh, then counters by making his own speech and talking about that ancient order bylaws uh, book and how Atticus is the last living heir of their Titus. Mm. Uh, and uh, this allows Atticus to give orders at dinner, and he orders that his father be returned, is the gist of it. Adam kind of refuses. Uh, he, he's citing his lack of being a zealot, uh, the, and that Atticus can be useful, but not indispensable. Now, one thing, Matt, I, and I hate to uh, display my ignorance here. Okay. But... Didn't they say that the original guy was Titus Braithwaite? Yes. And that and that the daughter and therefore the father is probably also a Braithwaite. So when they say that Tick is the is the last last living um, uh, progeny, I kind of didn't understand that because it feels it, and I don't understand why he thinks that he could order the other guy around when presumably. The uh, the other guy calling himself Adam is also a Braithwaite. So that part kind of confused me. Do, do you have any uh, anything to tell me that would illuminate me on this point? Well, I could only go as far as Atticus versus Christina, uh, because the, the, obviously this is a very male oriented society. Right. Uh, but as far as Atticus versus uh, Adam, uh, I don't have any clue why. Uh, he couldn't just order all those guys back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it could certainly be a struggle, but also why that tick would think that he could order him around. So, but, but clearly they need, uh, whatever, uh, evil plan they have for Atticus. And since, since this show is going whip crack fast, we see it in this episode. We certainly do. Uh, it probably uh, they probably don't want to do it on themselves because it feels like that somehow Atticus is going to get used up in this process that will give quote unquote, quote unquote Adam 
uh, what we find out to be eternal life. Eternal life. He wants to open a doorway to the Garden of Eden is what it turns out to be. But in the meantime, uh, Atticus actually uh, takes uh, Letty and George uh, to the tower uh, and they're looking for Montrose, Atticus's father. Um, Question mark. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the woman comes and uh, I'm glad I love the way that Letty just took care of her from behind. That was wonderful after she said all those horrible things. Uh, then. Evidently, they find some kind of uh, way to get through a, a wall, but it doesn't matter because when they go back outside, Montrose, Atticus's father, question mark, is uh, digging his way out of the ground, and he's <laughs> he's kind of pissed at them, uh, saying, let's get the hell out of here. Well, what's nice is, even though we heard that Montrose uh, wasn't so much into uh, genre fiction, Apparently, he did have a liking to uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, and so Montrose used a trick from Count of Monte Cristo. And George used his knowledge of the Count of Monte Cristo to figure out what Montrose had done. That's true. And uh, that's great because in the first episode, um, when Atticus went back to the Chicago apartment, where I guess where his father was living, he found not one, but two copies of the Count of Monte Cristo. So that paid off uh, really well for this particular episode. Love that. Uh, but they're going to try and get out of town. They, f they find a car. Uh, they get... It looks like it is the car that was not that was not injured in the accident with the guys from the town. It looks like it is that amazing car. Yeah, they, they take Christina's car. Bad. You never take Christina's car. Uh, because there might just be an invisible wall at the end of a bridge. I love that. Uh, I love that effect. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, this is Cabin in the Woods style. I loved it. That was great, too. Um, unfortunately, uh, getting in a uh, horrific car accident was something they couldn't see. It was not the worst thing that was uh, about to happen to some of them. That's for sure, because Adam and Christina pull up as their, our heroes are struggling to get out of the car. And they just start shooting everybody. They shoot yeah. Letty. Um, they... they it looks like that they're pointing the gun at Atticus, but I could, I mean, this is the point, Catfish, where I start to get completely confused. This is where I'm going, what the hell is happening? I don't care. I love it. But what the hell is happening? So, I, I mean, I can only judge by by what happens later, which is essentially they are going to, uh, you know, use healing uh, Letty and George as blackmail for Atticus to do what they want to do. What is not kind of not explained, which I think you just have to like kind of go, OK, how were they able to do that? I mean, when Letty pulls up her shirt, although she still got blood on her, she's got no wounds, no wounds whatsoever. So maybe they may not be able to have eternal life, but uh, they got a hell of a health plan. They got a hell of a health plan for sure. Uh, and the, and the, the trick is, it's like, OK, Atticus. We're going to save your people if you save our Adam by opening that door to the Garden of Eden. Right. And then some crazy sci-fi slash uh, ancient ritualistic stuff happens where it, it looks like the door does open. They're using Atticus as a point for energy. Energy's coming all around him. He's all just being electrified or, or some kind of energy-fied. And... Then the door opens up. Uh, we can actually see in that door that it is, I, I'm guessing, Atticus's ancestor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. I'm, let me see. I believe it's great, 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 great grandmother. Great. I think that's what they said. Is that what Christina said? Because I know Christina went through some of that with him uh, at yeah. one point, but I didn't know exactly how far back right. the line went. So they're showing her while she's pregnant. And, and I have to say, I, I can understand where you're thinking you're missing something here because she has a very enigmatic look on her face, mm. which we never quite understand, like, kind of what she's trying to communicate to him or maybe how she was involved, if at all, in, in, the, in the first experience. Maybe she wasn't, but the fact that she is what he sees is kind of curious. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, again, 
uh, a guy who I expected to see for another four or five episodes, uh, Adam and all his buddies, woof, they go out in a very unpleasant way. Well, they sure do. But uh, in the meantime, as you mentioned before, Letty realizes she hasn't been shot. And George and Montrose have that uh, conversation because oh, George boy. doesn't feel like he's going to make it. Uh, which, uh, you know, our poor one out for George, but he, he tells Montrose that he may be Atticus's father. And I wonder if this is part of the reason why Montrose was hard on on Atticus, but we also learned that Montrose used to be a happy-go-lucky guy and then a uh, kid, and then he suffered some abuse at the hands of Montrose's and George's father. Yeah. So I'm not sure what that, uh, what that has to do with it. I will say this. Here's a Shoggoth surprise I had. Not a no, no, no Shoggoth Sherlock. A Shoggoth surprise. I thought for sure uh, that George wasn't going to make it out of episode one. Wow. So uh, when he did, I thought, okay, well, then he'll be along for the ride. So they surprised me once. They surprised me again. Nice. <laughs> Two episodes in a row regarding the fate of George. Um, yeah, the whole place is coming down as Atticus is screaming, and somehow he breaks the breaks everything. And that's when that shot of energy just streaks out all over everywhere. It turns Adam into stone, and then the the concussion blows <laughs> blows the stone apart to dust, and and the whole place just starts collapsing in. And Atticus is running for his life out of the out of the collapse. And now, at the same time, though, Matt, what's what's interesting is we are also seeing the fire that occurred in 1833. So he's kind of that we're seeing the collapse that's happening now, but he's also seeing the fire from the past. Mm. OK, I didn't connect that. OK, so that's awesome. <laughs> Here's another part that I don't get. I guess because Atticus got out, we should assume that Letty and Montrose and George would have gotten out as well. Well, we we saw them get themselves together to leave a little bit earlier maybe not soon enough based on the uh, devastation we saw but but they, but they did get out my question to you uh matt is that we did not see christina and her friend who is also a boy uh get it oh. so my assumption is that they're still around now whether they are in on the grand plans that their dad had, I don't know. And maybe we will never see them again. But I did not see, at least for sure, Christina, I did not see her go down. Yeah, I did not see her go down. I don't recall seeing William go down. Here's what I come to, though. They get back to the car. And, of course, Montrose is is cradling George. And it's, it's awful. Um, and that's the way the episode ends. But where I want to go here, Catfish, is... All of this seems so surreal. Was any of it real? I, I I can't figure out if people aren't remembering what happened to them. If there's all this other kind of crazy magic stuff, all this crazy energy going on. And I know you're a book reader, so you can't tell me. But I'm just wondering if they've been like j catapulted into some kind of alternate reality. And that maybe they're all just laying dead there in that building. Oh, no. This is for sure happening, Matt. I feel it. Okay. All right. Well, that's good because I've, my mind was just completely unsettled by the end of this episode. And I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I loved this episode. But I'm also confused. Uh, well, um, uh, Matt, I, I, I mean, uh, what, what are you still confused by? I'm, he I'm here for you, buddy. I'll, I'll, I'll hold you in my tender arms. What, 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 what do you need? Yes, as opposed to our Penny Dreadful podcast, where it was always somebody help catfish. This is a section that we call Catfish Helps Somebody. Since we didn't see either Christina or William, naturally, if everybody else got out, they had to get out too, right? Uh, I think they got out. That's my prediction, is that Christina and her friend, who is a boy, got out. Okay. Who I also suspect is just her brother. Uh, is her brother? He's yeah, a boy. Sure, he's a boy and a friend and a brother. Yeah, that, that, that's still uh, that, just because she said that doesn't disqualify him from being her brother. She was just being cagey. Oh, okay, all right. I, I'm still. I'm just having trouble wrapping my head around the fact that all of this happened and that all of it happened in ten minutes. <laughs> it is. It is incredible. Well, you know, uh, those who do not learn from the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat it. Ah. Uh, once again, this energy—they tried to harness this energy, 
and uh, they were unable to uh, uh, harness it to the uh, ends that they wanted to harness it to. Okay. For sure. So you're saying that the fire in 1833 was caused by the same try them trying to do the same thing before i believe i think it was i think it was christina who s- explicitly said that oh re- that the reason why it was rebuilt was because that they, they were trying to do the same process and the energy just got away from them now see catfish helped somebody that's awesome yay yay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yay. I'm, 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 I'm gonna give you and this is this is more like a no shock if uh, uh, not, not, not in a sarcastic way, but in a, in a wonderment way, uh, catfish. Thank you. No shoggoth really, man. That's awesome. Yep. Yep. There you go. It happened. It happened again. So pretty much everything that was laid out in the first episode, right? That we've got these monsters we have to deal with that we have, you know, that, that for some reason they've been brought up to this area for reasons we don't know. That his father is missing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was sort of what set up in episode one for, okay, okay. This is what we're going to figure out the rest of the season. We're at the end of episode two. Dad's back. They're, oh, they're not in that mansion anymore. So what the heck? What the heck happens next, Matt? Man, all of the boxes are checked. So just from the, the title of the series, Lovecraft Country. Mm-hmm. Got to imagine that there are other places in that area or that they're going to go through uh, that have a similar supernatural slash racist things happening to them. I wonder. I mean, I, I have to say this. I'm I'm fully confident they know what they're doing. I'm sh- shocked, shocked that we're already out of this situation. So uh, let's see if they can continue the uh, both both parts of this story, the. Uh, obviously, I think they are w- well handling uh, the sort of racism uh, that uh, they have to deal with. The question is, can they keep the supernatural up when they go back home to Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, folks, we want your feedback. We want to know what you thought about this episode. Please. We do. Tweet to at Musical Concepts, at CJGman67, or at the word double the letters PHQ on Twitter. And use the hashtag Shoggoth Surprise. That's S H O G G O T H Surprise. When you do those tweets, so that we can keep track of them, we need to hear from you. You can also just reach out to us with a review on uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. You can even put uh, any of your thoughts in there as well. And all of it will include you in a contest to win a Funko Pop. Cthulhu is that the one that you're gonna do that's correct that's the one that's the, that's the one they're gonna get they're gonna get Cthulhu he's very cute and also quite deadly <laughs> oh you gotta love it do we want to play any games catfish do we want to have our Ooh. listeners play games with us well, all right well yeah first of all uh Matt it, it's not a podcast I, I don't know we, we didn't do this last week this is by completely my fault is uh we have to do your famous game which is Three words, the three-word description of the episode, and then ask our listeners to provide their own three-word description. All right. Well, I've got two sets this week, Catfish. Oh, that's so that's cheating, really. It's like six words. Well, it is. It, it's two separate submissions. How about that? No. Okay, still, good. Still, still no right. good. Still no good. We, I got to find a way to cheat every, every, you know, every once in a while. Last week, it was Sundown Cities, double S. Uh, this week, it's two sets of three words. Folks, you try to describe the episode in three words, or just how you feel about the episode is fine. That's what I went with this week. Two sets. First one is, what just happened? Okay. <laughs> and my second one is, wow, holy bleep. Uh, that, that was the way I felt about the episode after it was all over. So, uh, Catfish, do you have a set of three words? Yeah, my three words are, not f***ing around. Because this show is not fucking around. Can we say that? And I love it. I don't. I don't know. You know what? I just said it. <laughs> not bleeping around, says Catfish. Sure, sure. <laughs> Folks, if you want to submit three words again, at do- the word double the letter P H Q on Twitter, or you can find me at Musical Concepts or Catfish at C J G Man sixty seven, and we will be sure to share yours. Matt, like one more, one more question. I feel like we're going to have to do this. It's clear what this show is going to do. So, 
Matt, I want you to tell me what your needle drop of the week is. And that's, uh, you know, I guess kind of a description for, uh, you know, when you're watching the show and all of a sudden they start playing some some music. What was your uh, what was your needle drop of the week? Oh, I had to be the Jefferson's theme. I, I love that. Moving on up. That was a great song to hear at the beginning. It was perfectly uh, appropriate for what they were doing. I loved it. I will I will have to say that it is Whitey's on the Moon. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah. Because uh, you know, uh to you know, I sort of was able to identify uh James Baldwin last week and, and I thought that was magnificent. I mean, even better than the music was just to hear those words and but I had never heard Whitey's on the Moon and powerful. it's just power it's powerful. Yeah, powerful. It's powerful. So that was that was my needle drop of the week. I agree. I agree. And folks, I will try to find, I, I heard a couple other things that I felt were like repeated from last week. So maybe this week I'll put together a little bit of a, a mini pod within a pod uh, talking about the orchestral score of the show. Um, that there, there were some things that I were looking for that I did not get, uh, but we can go with that at a, at a future time. I love it. Anything else? Catfish? You know, uh, there's so many shows where it's like they set something up. I've said this over and over again, where it's like there's a setup and I really dig it. And then there's kind of some missteps or whatever. And so I'm like, you know, I have a lot of faith in something at the beginning and it sort of slowly goes down here. I have got no idea what's coming next week. Like I said, they pretty much wiped out all the plot points that they had established in the first episode. So, uh... I'm fascinated to see what comes next. Me too. It's just like, you know, set the pins up and knock them back down. If that's the way it's going to be the whole season, I am in for the ride. This is going to be awesome. It's so good. So we'll talk to you next week on Shuggeth Surprise. (laughs) Okay. All right. That's better. We're getting there. (laughs) I don't know how to do it. It's Catfish. What's really important for our podcast is we like to share listener feedback. We like to be told if we're wrong. It's double M. Please reach out to us. Tell us why Catfish is wrong. Two wonderful panelists. Double, 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 double P podcast. Double P. What I like to call. Double, 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 double P. What I like to call. Double, double, double P podcast. 